I am part of an editorial committee that is trying to publish the complete works of Rosa Luxemburg in English. Um, there will be many volumes um, for this. It's a, a very long effort. Uh, this is published by Verso in, uh, in New York. And right now we have had uh, two volumes published. The first one in 2013, which is um, uh, an introduction to political economy, and then the volume two, which was published in 2015, which is the accumulation of capital and also the anti-critique. And following this publication, which was, by the way, a brand new translation, um, there's been a revival of interest in Rosa Luxemburg. So there's been a number of events at the Left Forum in New York a couple of years ago, uh, a panel organized by the Rosa Luxemburg Institute, the Stiftung in New York, that was very successful. Then there was the launch of um, the publication of the accumulation of capital at, at Verso Publisher where Richard Wolff gave a talk. Um, there has been seminars uh, funded by the uh, Rosa Luxemburg Institute in New York uh, t teaching the accumulation of capital to the public. Um, these were free and they were very well attended. Um, so there is now this revival of interest in her, so this is really um, quite uh, encouraging and uplifting. The, the quick talk I'm going to give you is based upon um, a short essay I wrote for um, the Rosa Luxemburg Institute. This was published, this little booklet, Rosa Remix, which is an attempt to think about the relevance of Rosa Luxemburg today. So I have a couple copies here, feel free to grab it, and um, I'm sorry that I don't have more, but if you want one, give me your name and address and I will mail it to you. So we've entered an age where you know, the world is flat, to quote an international bestseller. We have a world of global competition, global markets, the ever-growing integration of world economies through the free movement of goods, capital, technology, labor, not so much. <laughs> Financial markets have also become fully globalized and foreign policy in the US and OECD member countries in general have favored political regimes that have implemented this complete privatization and deregulation of their economies, allowing American corporate interests to be present everywhere. And the textbooks of international business tell us that this is really good for economic growth, for productivity, it helps us to create better products, cheaper products, etc. But all of these neoliberal decades have brought us to the 2007-2008 crisis. So I'm going to ask a first question. Um, is the expansion of capital and the conquest of foreign markets driven by growth or is it driven by growth difficulties? And this is where the accumulation of capital is relevant for us in, in terms of thinking about these issues. So in the book, Luxembourg identifies a general dynamic that lies at the heart of the process of capital accumulation and geographic expansion, namely the chronic tendency to produce crises of overaccumulation. So capitalism needs to continually open up new territories to avoid crises. And um, this is critical to the very survival of the system. Her analysis is based on a critical reading of Marx's Circuits of Capital in volume two. It's a rather technical argument. Um, but essentially, in, in volume two, you have the circuit of capital in a context of simple reproduction. So there's no reinvestment by the capitalist. All the surplus value which is being extracted from labor is spent on consumption good. And so the whole economy continues, but it's unchanged in scale, right? And proportions. And then you have a system of expanded reproduction where a portion of the surplus value is actually reinvested and that allows the system to grow in proportion. And then you have a situation where the surplus value is reinvested, but the composition of capital is changing, right? So there is um, more and more of a, of a reinvestment in capital goods. And this is the situation where Rosenberg identifies, um, sorry, Luxembourg identifies um, a problem with the realization of surplus value. So the capitalist system, if it's closed, is unsustainable. Um, and her insight focuses on the role plays, played by external non-capitalist markets. So the idea here is you're gonna have a crisis um, and 
unless you can turn to non-capitalist external markets to realize the um, surplus value. Now, where do these external markets get the money to actually buy the products and realize the surplus value? So there's three possibilities. They can get it by selling, by having workers sell their labor power for a wage. Uh, what is the link between Rosa Luxemburg and the iPhone? Um, I'm gonna ask, not an obvious link, right? But there were already 42 million iPhones in use in China even before Apple uh, actually realized a deal with the carrier to, off to offer the handsets officially. 42 million iPhones. Where is the money coming from to buy the iPhones? Well, as it turns out, China embraced the capitalist mode of production, so you have all these workers and they have wages and they can buy consumption goods. But if once they sell their labor power, they're no longer external to the system uh, of capitalistic production. They've been absorbed by it, and so it doesn't really solve this problem of the realization of surplus value. The second possibility is to tap into existing wealth, raw materials, gold reserves, but these things will actually be exhausted at some point, right? So you're draining um, this value that exists outside of capitalism, but at some point you're gonna run into <laughs> um, some limits. And then the third option is the possibility of getting loans from capitalists. And so this brings us to the role played by international finance and the link between finance and imperialism. And this is where I believe that Rosa Luxemburg is really relevant today, right? Like her work is still extremely current. So her arguments is that loaned funds um, are eventually routed back to purchase productive capital from the country where the capi capital initially originated. And this is how the surplus value is realized and this adds to the process of capital accumulation. Now, how does this work exactly? The exact mechanism is this. First, the, the profits are extracted from the workforce at home in a rich country. Now, instead of being redeployed in that country, the surplus value is re redeployed through loans overseas. Um, the poorer country uses the funds to buy imported capital goods. So the funds are actually transformed into productive capital. And this essentially provides the means for a poor country to buy equipment and um, develop their industrial infrastructure. She gives the example of Egypt. And this is actually really interesting. Um, so following the civil war in the US um, in the 1860s, um, there was this cotton mania or cotton bubble. And so all of a sudden, um, everyone decided it was a good idea for Egypt to start producing cotton. And so how is this cotton pr production financed? It fi it's financed through loans from Britain. And by 1874, she shows that the public debt in Egypt had grown from three to 94 million pounds. Three to 94 million pounds. So there's a crisis of over indebtedness Right? This country is buying um, productive capital. It's financing this through loans. The loan increases. In Egypt, this was public debt. You arrive at a point where you have a crisis of over-indebtedness. Um, as a parenthetical here, it's interesting that um, some people read Rosa Luxemburg as uh, a precursor of Hyman Minsky. So for those of you who have a background in, in economics, you may have heard of Hyman Minsky. Minsky uh, back in 2008, the financial crisis was hailed as a Minsky moment, and this was like on the cover of the New York Times. Um, the idea here is that if, the new, if new debt is being used to pay interest on existing debt, you have something that's called Ponzi finance, right? So you have debt, you have your interest, you can't even pay the interest anymore, so you have to borrow more money to pay the existing interest. That cycle um, of finance is unsustainable and typically will lead to a collapse. So to go back to the argument, right, if you trace the funds, um, the funds actually ends back where they started because um, the country is actually using the funds to buy capital goods from the country where the funds originate, right? So the money comes back um, and this is how it realizes the surplus value in that country. 
Now, ultimately, how, how are the loans and the interest repaid, right? This is the last link in the piece. You have this loan, now it has to be repaid. And in Egypt's case, um, the source here was the Egyptian fella peasant economy. So three different sources of repayment, right? The land, some of which was actually pledged um, as a collateral for public debt. Um, repayment can also occur through labor power, forced work, forced uh, labor, and then also through the tax system. So you can actually extract um, a share of national income um, simply through taxation, right? So different mechanism of debt repayment. So though the capital investments in foreign countries and the demand of these countries for capital imports could be viewed as something positive, right? Because at first glance, they provide the means to further development. In her analysis, the whole scheme conceals something that's a lot more sinister, which is the extraction of value by the capitalist system and also some, a power dynamic um, and a political dominance, right? So what is this power dynamic? You can think of finance here as a tool of control. Um, and as a, a, a mode of imperialism. Now, interestingly enough, in Egypt by um, 1882, so remember the, in Egypt, 1874, right, the, the debt reaches this, this huge level. By 1882, the British army is occupying Egypt. What a coincidence. And uh, the official reason was to strike down a rebellion but really, in Luxembourg's analysis, the military occupation was merely the enforcing arm of debt collectors. So I want to pause and sum up some as aspects of this analysis that interest me today. Um, I think the idea of finance as a mechanism of extraction of national income from non-capitalistic groups and as a basis for capital accumulation, and in fact, as a, as a necessary driver, right, to avoid collapse, I think is a really powerful idea. And the case of Greece jumps to mind. Um, so when you think about the case of Greece, it's interesting to note that the ownership of Greek debt, although it's changed a lot, right, with the different bailouts of Greece, but for the most part, it was always foreign owned. Um, a large fraction of the of the Greek debt was owned to the Eurozone bailout fund or other Eurozone countries. And in this respect, a key difference between Greece and a country, for instance, like Japan, which had debt to GDP ratios in Japan that were, that were way higher than in Greece. But in Japan, the, the debt was not held by foreign capital. It was held domestically, right? So you can think about who actually holds the debt as being uh, relevant. In Luxembourg's analysis, the debt is held by a country that is using this mechanism of international finance to, to, to uh, realize surplus value and avoid a crisis at home. So the growth of finance is, is really needed to keep capitalism going. Uh, capital accumulation would come to a halt with a crisis of over indebtedness if Greece were to default. And so the system cannot afford the Greek default. And it's interesting to me that Greece was not really allowed to declare bankruptcy, right? That was not an option. Um, avoiding default seems to be the prime motivation of all these negotiations. Most of the money in the new bailout packages was used to repay existing debt, repay um, international loans, rather than to actually rebuild the Greek economy. So none of the money for the bailout really made its way into the economy. So the, the bailout loans were motivated by the protection of the rest of the Eurozone and by the protection of creditors and not so much um, by uh, providing assistance to an over-indebted country. So we could think about the link between this mechanism of finance and extraction and, and, imper and, and imperialism. So in Greece, the bailouts came with conditions. The lenders imposed these harsh austerity terms requiring budget cuts, lower social spending, and tax increases. 
And so it's interesting for me to think about whether we could analyze these demands as some form of extraction, tapping into the non-capitalist sector. So we could ask the same question as Luxembourg did in Egypt and Turkey, you know, ultimately who pays for these loans? Now in Greece, um, the government was seeing the shrinking of tax revenue and so the, the, the culprit was really rampant tax evasion by corporations or wealthy individuals who can hide their earnings. Um, under the pressure to balance their budget, the Greek government added new taxes on the bulk of citizens who were not tax delinquent. So if you ask the question, you know, who is the payor of last resort, just to be tongue in cheek with lender of last resort, who's the payor of last resort? It's going to be the Greek middle class, right? Or the Greek people. Um, there was even a headline, I think, in um, a publication by the Rosa Luxemburg Institute, which was uh, something like, um, sell your islands, uh, you lazy Greeks. Well, this was like, the idea that I think resonates with Rosa Luxemburg is, hey, you've got some existing wealth that is sitting there, right, that lies outside of this capitalism system, and you can now access this pre-existing wealth through this mechanism of debt repayment. Um, now, what are some new dimensions of the problem since Rosa Luxemburg wrote The Accumulation of Capital, uh, which she wrote just before World War I, right? Um, arguably now, finance has evolved um, and we have some differences, so I wanna engage with you to think about these differences a little bit. Um, arguably, we've had a shrinking of the non-capitalist sector, right, uh, following the expansion of capitalism and the capitalistic mode of production. It's harder today to find regions of the world where you don't have a, a capitalistic economy, right? So that has shrunk. Um, there's a growing complexity of financial markets. Um, so there are now potentially many layers of intermediation between the domestic extraction of profit on the one hand and its redeployment in international financial markets. So for this reason, it's not so easy to trace the money um, or at least the origin of loans in the same way as Luxembourg did, right? It's gonna be a little bit more complicated because we have these layered levels of intermediation due to a more complex financial uh, system. How am I doing on time? <laughs> two, almost, minutes. two minutes? Okay, I'm, I'm almost done. Um, when Rosa Luxemburg was writing, um, there was no corporate income tax, no withholding taxes, so um, capital was free to move around. I think today, uh, there, um, capital is redeploying itself around the, the, the globe, but it's not so straightforward as uh, Luxemburg's analysis because there's more complicated legal regime. Um, Another dimension which is relevant to extraction today is the rate of interest, right? She doesn't really talk about, you know, what the interest rate is. I think today capital markets uh, are key to determining exactly, you know, how much interest is going to be paid. And I think that that's part of the mechanism of extraction today, right? And I don't think it was so much at the time she was writing. So to conclude, um, I think if you read the accumulation of capital in that prison, and I'm sorry I went quickly, you know, because I was trying to squeeze in a lot um, but if, if you read this book and think about her description of international finance, the link between finance and the realization of crises and finance as a mechanism to avoid financial crises, you'll find her very relevant today. Um, but one thing that is really missing in her work is a financial sector, right? So if you go back to Marx's circuit of capital, you really only have a production sector and a consumption sector, and you don't have a financial sector. The role played by banks, right, the creation of money, all of that is missing. And so if you introduce modern finance into the mix, I think you can think about things like financial derivatives, which is a way to borrow against the future, as yet another way that the system has come up with to, to rescue itself and avoid a realization crisis, right? There's um, the surplus value cannot be realized 
but hey, what if you borrow against the future? And now all of a sudden you have a plug and you're just deferring the problem into the future. And I think that modern finance has been this really interesting way of doing this, right? When you think about the role of derivatives in the, the past financial crisis, um, just further postpone the problems into the future. Okay, um, I guess that concludes my analysis. Thank you. Thank you.